I can still remember that long ago day. I remember it vividly. As a matter of fact, I can still see the five young people enter the restaurant where I was working as a waiter in Atlanta, Georgia. The host sat them in my section. I was the next server up. They were in about their late teens, early 20s. They appeared as though they were dressed for an evening out, a concert, or a movie, perhaps. They were a pretty lively group of kids. Now, as I waited on them and I watched them, I could see their deep friendship. I could see their love for one another. It was tangible, their joy, their freedom, their love of life. There was so much laughter at the table. There were high fives at the table. There was even singing at this table. So much life. Now, I observed all of this between my repeated trips back and forth to the bathrooms to use drugs. You see, at this point in my life, I had become a prisoner to drugs, and I carried my captor in my apron pocket. He demanded to be with me at all times. He forbade me to laugh. He forbade me to feel. He forbade me to sing. He even forbade me to love. Now, as it happened, as I continued to wait on these young kids, suddenly a deep emptiness welled inside of me. And there was even a bit of envy. The youngsters appeared to be so full of life, something that I had lost in my addiction years ago. My inner core was lifeless. I couldn't remember the last time I felt real joy or happiness or even had a friend that wasn't connected to drugs in some way. My addiction had taken me prisoner, and life as I remembered it was long gone. My family, my friends, all gone. I was convinced that life as an addict was my final destiny. I would never, ever again experience the happiness that I was seeing at this table. My soul was hollow dead. My life was like a valley of dry bones. Dead, dry bones. Lifeless, worthless, desperately hopeless dry bones. Now, that may sound like a strange metaphor to describe my life, a valley of dry bones. It's a picture of defeat. It's a picture of despair. It's a picture of hopelessness. Dry bones indicate that death occurred some time ago. A person who had been dead for quite some time, if the, beds are, if the bones are now very dry, there isn't much hope for dry bones to live. And that had become my condition. Desperately hopeless. Now, that may not be your story this morning. You may not have had the same dry bones experience of using drugs as me. But perhaps, just perhaps, some other life circumstance has become your dry bone season. That season that has led you to defeat or despair or hopelessness. It could be a work situation, loss of a job, long-term unemployment, a physical crisis, even a community crisis where everyone is impacted. It could be even as nuclear as a family crisis, divorce, sickness, or even worse, death. You look all around you and it all seems hopeless. Everything seems to have gone wrong. You begin to feel defeated. You begin to feel there's no hope. You lose energy. You lose purpose. 
And before you know it, your hope has become as dry bones. All you see is hopelessness and despair. Our text today is about how God can breathe hope and new life over all of our situations today. It's a vision God gives to Ezekiel, who is God's appointed prophet. In the text, the Spirit of the Lord brings Ezekiel to a valley of dry bones. The bones represent Israel's hopelessness. The bones are a glimpse into the depth of despair and hopelessness that has settled upon Israel. You see, they've been conquered and taken off into captivity by the Babylonians. Their temple, which is the center of their worship and their faith, that's been destroyed. They believe their God has abandoned them. And life as they remember it is not the same. They had become a hopeless people, and they see no chance of revival. Friends, I think sometimes our realities can mirror the Israelites' flight, plight of hopelessness. Just in the recent years, everything about our lives changed. We had to live a new way. We even had to worship a new way. And then there was the onslaught of division and separation. There was injustice, civil inequities. All of these issues can easily discourage a people. And before you know it, ultimately, hopelessness sets in. So friends, this morning our text is a vision of hope. It's a message of hope. Friends, there's always hope in the presence of God. There is hope with the Word of God, and there is hope with the Spirit of God. I'll repeat that one for you. There is hope with the Word of God, and there is hope with the Spirit of God. Now, we're going to take a deeper look at these two truths. I would love for you to follow along with me in your bulletins, the Scriptures in the bulletin. Let's unpack this together. Follow along with me as I read verses 1 through 3. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them. And behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley. And behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Friends, immediately we see the presence of God. In verse 1, the hand of the Lord was upon me. In verse 2, he led me around among the bones. And in verse 3, he asked me, son of man, can these bones live? Saints, God is present even in the midst of Israel's hopelessness. God is present as Ezekiel is carried to a valley full of dry bones. God even walks around among the bones with Ezekiel. This morning, you may look at your own situation, and that's all you can see are dry bones. But friends, as hopeless and desolate as it looks, the presence of God is there. He's walking around in the midst of your situation this very moment. Pivot is somewhat like a valley of dry bones. But the presence of God is truly in that place. God is walking among those dead bones right now. So many men, they come in hopeless, lost, desperate, defeated. You can see the anguish and desperation in their faces. You feel the hopelessness that has plagued their situations. You can see the weight of their troubles as they walk through the door. But then they walk into the presence of God. And we begin to pray for them. And I see mothers begin to weep with hope. And then they smile with joy. And I see fathers begin to stand a little bit taller with a glimmer of hope before their sons. And wives embrace their husbands. 
with an embrace of hopefulness. And then I see the student himself begin to weep tears of hope. There's hope in the presence of God, no matter the circumstance, even in the midst of dry bones. God's presence offers us hope, friends. So again, the question, how can God breathe hope and new life over our situations, over our lives, over our circumstances, over our dry bones? Well, there's a spiritual recipe, friends. There's a spiritual recipe for hope. There's a spiritual recipe for renewal. And there's only two ingredients. The Word of God and the Spirit of God. God breathes hope and new life through His Word and through His Spirit. Let's go a little deeper. Are you with me? Let's look at verses 4 through 6. Then He said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live, and I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. First, Ezekiel is commanded to speak God's words over the bones. These are not Ezekiel's words, but they're God's words. Although God addresses Ezekiel, the words address the bones directly. Oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Saints, that's our first ingredient. God's word. It's alive. It's active. It does not return void. It succeeds in the very thing for which God sends it. Oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Do you remember creation? Do you remember what happened there? God's word speaks creation into being. God spoke and it was done. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God said, let there be an expanse between the waters, and there was sky, and then land, and then seas. Each time God spoke, it was so because God's word, saints, is alive. It's active. So Ezekiel follows God's instructions, and he preaches God's words to the bone. Follow along with me to verse 7. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound. And behold, a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to its bone. Remarkable. God's word moves. God's word bring about change. In the text, while Ezekiel was preaching the word of God, there's a noise. A rattling sound. And the bones begin to move. And then they connect themselves bone to bone. Amazing. I even recall a, a similar movement in my own life. It was shortly after I arrived at Pivot. I'd been there for about two weeks. At Pivot, we studied the Bible every day. 6.30 in the morning, we're up with God's word. Bible study is a daily discipline at Pivot. At the time, I didn't quite understand what I was reading, but I read it anyway out of strict obedience. But I recall this one day. We were reading the Bible. It was the story of Joseph. There was suddenly this stirring in my spirit, sort of a rattling, if you will, and out of nowhere. I just began to weep uncontrollably. I couldn't understand what was happening. But even at the same time, there was a peace that settled on my heart that said, there's hope. You're going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Saints to God, the word of God brings us hope. 
several of the men, they participate in an alpha course at Stanwich Church. Nikki Gumbel is the known pioneer or developer of the Alpha Course. It's a basic introduction to Christianity. I'm really awed by Nikki Gumbel's story. For years, Nikki was a devout atheist, atheist to the core, total non believer. But today, Nikki is a true believer in Jesus and is a messenger of the gospel everywhere. Now, Nikki explains his conversion happened after reading the Bible. His intention as an atheist to read the Bible was to discredit, was to prove it all wrong. Oh, but God's word is alive. It's active. As he read the Bible, it changed his life forever. Nikki Gumbel is now a lover of Jesus, and he's committed to spreading the good news of the gospel. Saints, we can all turn to the word of God. It's alive. It's active, it imparts new life, it renews hope. I think that deserves an amen. 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 Now, that story doesn't end here with the rattling of a few bones. There is a second ingredient of hope. There is a second ingredient to new life. And that second ingredient is the Spirit of God. Come and go along with me to verses 8 through 10. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Just a quick pause right here. But there was no breath in them. Now, it's one thing to have the bones rattle, and then to have the bones sort themselves, it's another thing to connect them into skeletons and then to clothe them with flesh and skin. But at this point, they've simply changed from dead bones to dead bodies. They still have no life. The word says there was no breath in them. Keep going with me. Let's move to verse 9. Then he said, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain as they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Verse 9 says, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. God breathed into the bones. The Hebrew word for breath and wind are the same word for spirit. God breathed his spirit into the bones and brought them to life. Friends, the second ingredient in our recipe for hope is the spirit of God. The spirit of God makes us alive. The same breath that gave life to the bones is the same breath that gives us new life today. Amen. This was even so in the very beginning. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, we read, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. God gave man his first breath, just as God does with the dry bones in the desert, and just as God does with us today, friends. He gives us his breath. He gives us his spirit. He makes us alive. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As I was thinking about that very truth, another often used metaphor for God's spirit comes to mind, water. We just kind of saw that demonstration right here today, water and God's spirit. In scripture, water often represents God's spirit. And I remember this experience I had in my mother's garden when I was a young child. My mother loved plants. There were plants everywhere. 
She had a real green thumb. We may have a few green thumbers here today. Bless your hearts if you are. I remember one spring, I joined her in her garden and asked if I could plant my own plant. She instructed me how, and she told me, you have to water it every day. So I planted my little seedling, and I was so delighted to see my little plant grow. I wish you could have seen my delight. I was really excited about it. But as kids will be kids, it wasn't long before my attention had gone somewhere else, and I stopped watering my plant. Sometime later, I noticed my plant was no longer standing upright. It was leaning over, pretty withered. So I told my mom my plant had died. I remember her saying consolingly to me, son, it's not dead. All it needs is a little water. It's the secret ingredient for plants. She got some water and she put it on my plant and said, just give it some time. Well, the next day, I come out to see my plant, and there it is, standing just as tall as ever. My plant was alive again. Friends, in the same way, God's Spirit is our secret ingredient. His Spirit makes us alive. His Spirit refreshes us. Two ingredients, the Word of God and the Spirit of God. The Word of God gives us new life, and the Spirit of God makes us alive. And the good news today, my brothers and sisters, is that we have access to both. We have access to the Word of God, and we have access to the Spirit of God. Access given to us through the cross of Jesus. It was planned that way from the very beginning. If you're familiar with the book of John, chapter 1 reads, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. John goes on further to write, The Word became flesh and dealt and dealt and dwelt among us. Friends, Jesus is the Word. Jesus is our hope. While we were yet still sinners, dry bones even, apart from God, Jesus died so that we may have life and that we may have it abundantly. Now he dwells in us. He in us and we in him. Can these valleys of dry bones really live? Can there be hope in the midst of despair? God alone knows, saints. In your dry bone moment, speak the word of God. In your dry bone moment, call on the spirit of God. No longer are we a helpless people. Call on the name of Jesus. He is as near to us as our own breath. Jesus. When I first started the sermon, I shared with you a moment of my life when I was desperately without hope. My dry bone season, if you will. There I was in a state of utter despair, just yearning to simply laugh again. But oh, but God, I'm so thankful for Pivot. I'm so thankful for Pivot, a place where dry bones can live again. Friends, turning to God's word and calling on God's spirit, it gives us abundant and everlasting life in the name of Jesus. Together, we've all been called to live again, to rise up, 
to rise up united in Christ, a vast army of the Lord. Amen.